Hi. Hi, how are you? Doing great here. Finally, finally we got some summer and um, expect the thing with the flood right now here in, in the north of Germany. We're waiting for the water. Oh. And um, well, it should arrive this weekend and we have some, some red lard right now. But I think it's not that tough like it was in the south of Germany. And yeah, highest water since 400 years. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. Man. Are you still sitting in Florida in the sun, having a whole yeah, summer? Yeah, well, we just we just had a big storm, right? Oh, and, okay. Um, and uh, but that went through here and didn't cause any problems, so yeah. I'm enjoying it. You know, uh -huh. we had some rain which we needed and just went past, and off uh -huh. we go. Oh, great, <laughs> great, perfect. Yeah, you're on the west side of Florida. Then. Yes. Yeah. Is this a difference concerning the storms and hurricane thing? It seems like it. Oh, okay. Oh, good. <laughs> I, I don't know that I can say for sure yet, but yeah. it seems like at least the area that we're in tends to get less storms than the rest of Florida. Wow, okay. So that's good. Oh, good. Very good. Yeah, safe place. Oh, it's called Safe Harbor or something? Safety Harbor is the town. Ah, oh, okay. Uh, it's in the Tampa Bay area. Ah, oh, right. Okay. Wow. The, the one with the beautiful sunset, isn't it? Yes. Uh, <laughs> fantastic. So. Great. Yeah, um, last talk was about um, those bits and bytes thing, and I got a question from a customer. Um, he's asking me about um, one thing which maybe leads directly into an, an, to our new main subject for the day. But first, what he was asking about was um, the thing, the difference between 24-bit and this fixed point and 32-bit floating point. Okay. And then we have we heard also about 64-bit floating point. And I think it's a very good question, because I think that leads into a lot of confusion. Because right. I remember there was also, wasn't it, Cubase um, delivers something like 32-bit floating point recording files, stuff like that. But well, let's start with this difference. What is 24-bit fix and 32-bit floating point? Okay, so... 24-bit fixed and 32-bit floating point both have basically the same amount of precision. Yeah. When floating point, the way floating point is represented is that you have two parts, which are the uh, mantissa and the exponent. Oh, okay, and yeah. Mm -hmm. The mantissa is in 32-bit floating point is 24 bits. It's actually right. 23 bits with an implied 24th bit but it's, uh -huh. it's 24 bits. Okay. And so what happens is that the mantissa is essentially a number that represents a fraction. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's, um, it, and so the thing is that just like with 24-bit fixed, the number re represents a fraction. All the fixed point representations when, you do, when you're doing audio, mm -hmm. the idea is that full scale is equal to 1. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Zero is equal to zero. Mm -hmm. And negative full scale is equal to minus one. Mm -hmm. And so all the values in between the, the zero and the positive full scale are fractions of one, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you, had, if you had one bit, well, that's not quite true. You can't have one bit. If you had, let's say that you had a two bit. Uh, sorry. Let's say you had three bit fixed point. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So the first bit is a sign bit. It determines whether or not the uh, the signal is positive or negative. Okay. Yeah. And then the other two bits represent the total magnitude. Okay. Oh, okay. Right. So if all the bits are zero, then you have a value of zero. Okay. Now, the thing is that basically, if the first bit is zero, then that means that it's not a negative number. And the other two bits correspond to the magnitude. So you have four, po you have four possible values for the other two bits. You okay. can have zero, 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 one, one, zero, or one, one. Yeah. Okay. There's four of them, right? Four of them, yeah. So, so one, one, is the equivalent of the value of the number being one. Okay. So, uh, 
one zero would be the equivalent of the number being, you know, three quarters. Mm -hmm. Zero one would be, well, actually, sorry, that's not quite correct either. Um, so it was we one uh, zero. It's, it's it's in four it's in four segments, right? With the maximum value being one. So you have yeah. essentially a value of zero uh, of zero point three three three. You know, one third. Mm -hmm. Point six 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 two thirds and one. So okay. you you basically split up the interval between zero and one into the into four chunks. Okay. Mm -hmm. And when so as you go in, you add more bits. You get to divide it up into finer and finer chunks. The fractions get finer and finer. Okay. 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 Um. So more adding more bits in fixed point adds more precision. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now in floating point. The idea is that that part is exactly the same. Mm -hmm. You have a sign mm -hmm. bit, mm -hmm. and then you have 23 bits that are used for the fraction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's exactly the same number of bits as you're using in the 24-bit fixed point representation. Okay. Mm -hmm. But then you have eight more bits, and the eight more bits are used as the exponent. What the uh, exponent well. is, is it basically tells you what power of two to multiply the fraction by. All right. Wow. This is there. So you can show a thirty-two bit floating point. You have this twenty-four bits plus this eight exponent. This is there you can represent a huge number. Huh? Right. So yeah. the thing is that you know the 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 twenty-four bits that you have for the mantissa can mm -hmm. represent all the fractions that you can do in the fixed point mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with the same amount of precision. Then, if you want to, but let's say that you want to, that you have a signal that goes above the value of one, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then what you could say is the exponent exponent is two. Okay. I'm sorry. The exponent is equal to one, so that you multiply the fraction by two, and you get a number that's bigger than one. It could go anywhere from uh, zero to two. Okay. Okay. Uh -huh. But the gradations, right, are now twice as big. Yeah. Okay. All right. Right. So the, the relative step size of the maximum value hasn't changed, but the absolute step size has changed when yeah. you go to the next exponent. And if you go to an even bigger exponent, then the step size goes up. Now you can also have negative exponents, so they go in the opposite direction. You do. A, you're describing a smaller range, mm -hmm. and you s describe it with more precision. The step size goes down. Okay. So this is the thing where you move those 24 bits, mantissa up and down. Correct. Okay. So now the thing is that the way that floating point works is that it's not, it doesn't do that on like the, for the entire history of the signal. It does it for every single number. Wow. So the way there, there, there is the implication that mm. the highest bit in the mantissa is always going to be one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. For what, right. what are called normalized numbers. And there's non-normalized numbers, so you can represent even smaller numbers if you denormalize the floating point. But the thing is that most processors don't process denormalized numbers properly. Well, it's not that they don't do it properly, it's that they do it very slowly. Okay. So I don't know if you've heard of this, but you know, this is something that's reasonably well known in the DSP programming circles, especially for host-based processing. It's called the denormal bug. Okay. And yeah. basically if the person who's coded up the processor hasn't taken care to avoid the denormal bug, what you'll find is that the signal processor will use very little DSP or it will use the amount of DSP that it uses mm -hmm. under normal conditions when signal's running through it. Mm -hmm. But then when you stop playing, the CPU load spikes. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, that is, yeah, right. I'm sure, I'm sure that people have seen that in the past. Absolutely, you know, yeah. Most processors have this handled at this point, but it is something that you always have to be concerned about. What yeah. happens is that if you have like an EQ or a reverb or some other processor with a recursive DSP structure, yeah. you know, the signal goes through the EQ and, you know, maybe it's, uh, well, the feedback points yeah. at least are always getting smaller when you run, when you run a zero signal into it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what happens is that eventually they'll get small enough that they're below the normalization point and the normal the number becomes denormalized and then every mathematical operation that the CPU does takes like 10 times as long okay. and as a result 
as the as the input into the processor goes to zero, the processing load goes way up. Processing silence becomes expensive. Okay. So usually current signal processors, you know, that are, are coded to deal with that case will go and uh, flush it's called flushing denormals to zero. Basically, the number is so small that it doesn't have any impact on the signal. So instead of treating it as a very small number, you just make it zero. And um, and then you don't suffer the denormalization penalty. So let's let's exclude denormals because they're mm -hmm. you know not really useful for audio signal processing. You know, they're like minus... I, I don't actually remember what the number is, but it's like... Um, it's like minus 700 dB or oh, something okay. like that. Okay. It's so small that you yeah. know, it's not worth considering. So it's best to just flush that to zero. Okay, okay. If we, if we talk about a signal that isn't denormalized, mm -hmm. the thing is that basically the idea is that... As, um, hang on one second, okay? I'm, I'm yeah. just going to click the door. Okay. <laughs> I have to write this down. There's some drums being played in another room, and I just wanted to try to. Oh, okay. Out a little bit. <laughs> um, so, uh, if if you if we exclude denormalized numbers and mm -hmm. we only use normalized numbers, what we'll find is that basically everything that we are going to represent in a floating point number is going to be like something between a value of one half and one mm -hmm, mm -hmm. multiplied by some power of two I have to write because this down. there's an implied there's an implied uh, full digit uh, okay. or, or, or between one and one between or between one and two multiplied by some power of two Okay. You know, it, you, there's alternate ways that you can think about the representation, but the idea is that basically, um, as soon as you go from the domain in the mantissa mm -hmm. of, for example, between one and two, the exponent will change, and mm -hmm. the mantissa will shift back to between one and two. Right. So All if right. the mantissa represents between one and two, yeah, and then you plus, uh, and then you hit two, the idea is that you can represent two as the value 1 times 2. Mm -hmm. Okay. So mm -hmm. the exponent will go up by 1 and the mantissa will drop back to 1. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then now as you go from 2 to 4, yeah. the mantissa will go from 1 to 2 being multiplied by 2 and as soon as you hit 4, the mantissa will drop back to 1 and the multiplier will change to 4. Okay. So okay. the thing is that for any given number in floating point, you will have a fraction that has that has twenty four bits of precision, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. lower than what the essentially the the largest value that's a power of two above the number that you're using is. Okay. It's a little it's a little complicated. Yeah, the, yeah. The point is that yeah. basically. For whatever number you have, you have a full 24 bits of precision. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. And where that 24 bits of precision goes to gets shifted up and down depending mm -hmm. on the value of the number. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the pro so the, the benefit to that is that, you know, if, for example, you have a signal that, it, you know, gets large, yeah. you don't lose precision. Yeah. Either at the top end or the bottom end. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So when you know when it goes up, when the value goes above full scale, when it goes above one to mm -hmm. two, mm -hmm. in a fixed point system, it clips. Yeah, excellent. In a floating point system, it just keeps going up. Yeah. Now, right. the thing is that once you go above that, go above the one, mm -hmm. what happens is that the um, that the step size. Mm -hmm has now gone up by a factor of two. Yeah, all right, okay. Right, so so the steps as you go up above one now have twice the size, but the relative precision to its value is the same. Okay, mm-hmm, okay. Okay, 
Right. Okay. I understand. And then. In the flip okay. side, mm -hmm. when you go down. Yeah. Yeah. Right. When you go down to a half or to a mm -hmm. quarter or to a sixteenth. I think we do it the way then, the other way same around. thing. The relative precision yeah. moves down with the top value. Okay. So the thing is that you actually retain more precision. Yeah. Than you would in a fixed point system because when you go down to a half or a quarter or a sixteenth mm -hmm, as mm -hmm. the sort of the overall value, mm -hmm. the thing is that the bottom part, those bottom bits, don't change. You only have twenty four of them. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. like if you go down. Um, it's 6 dB per bit, right? So mm -hmm. if you go down, say, 30 dB, mm -hmm. then you have five bits that mm -hmm. you're not using at the top. If you have a 24-bit signal, that means that there's only 19 bits of representation. Yeah, yeah. With a 24-bit float, there's still, I'm sorry, with a 32-bit float, there's still 24, 24. bits of mm -hmm. representation. Yeah. Okay, so the thing is that you basically, you, have, you maintain precision throughout all the values for both very big numbers and very small numbers in floating point. But the relative step size between yeah. steps in the signal changes depending on exactly what regime you're in. And that does add a little bit of complication to the overall yeah. analysis of the algorithms and things like that. Yeah, that's what this is my next question. How are you going to deal with this stuff when the signal goes to an equalizer, is processed to some sent ways, going some together, and some at the end of the day you have there are two channels with a lot of floating point maths going on, and then you have to deal with all of stuff. I remember there was one word that you posted. It was a question from Bob Katz, and he's asking if um, there. He's got some question about Spectra Foo, and you answered to him. There was, I think, it was on the beta list. Um, this is at Spectra Foo's floating point clean. Yes. And um, it was an interesting word because uh, that really brought me also up to the thing where I said, "Is there a problem with f um, with floating point?" And if you explain this, I can imagine this is. Theoretically, it is no problem, but in practice, there seems to be some some obstacles to get. Or, well, isn't the thing is that, that basically, you know, in my experience in general, mm -hmm. we can you, you you get slightly better results out of floating point. Yeah. For the same mantis size. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now the thing is that once you go to a large enough mantissa. Mm -hmm. The floating point aspects start to become immaterial. I can imagine. Okay. All right. So, so the thing is, like you asked about double precision, sixty-four bit floating point. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, sixty-four bit floating point has a forty-eight bit mantissa and a sixteen bit uh, exponent. Wow. Okay. In audio, we don't really care about the sixteen bit exponent. Yeah. The eight bit exponent is fine. You know, we just don't process signals with that much dynamic range. Yeah, definitely. Um, it turns out that the 48-bit mantissa, which would be the equivalent of a 48-bit float, yeah. a double precision 24-bit fixed point float, actually probably has all the dynamic range that you need to do, you know, clean audio calculations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so the the floating point aspect is just sort of, you know, convenient in, in 64-bit float. Mm -hmm. um, the additional bits are really important in fixed point for processing. So, okay. you know, uh -huh. processing uh -huh. at 48 bits for a lot of types of algorithms yeah. or or at least more than 24 bits for a lot of mm. types of, of algorithms is important. Okay, you can imagine, yeah. And we went over this a little bit last week. It's, you know, it's this whole yeah. thing about cancellation. You essentially wind yeah. up losing, you have what's called a catastrophic loss of precision. Yeah. Where essentially, what you're interested in is in the difference between two very similar numbers. And so since they're similar, you've essentially lost the precision. In fixed mm -hmm. point, you lose the precision no matter what. And in floating point, you lose the precision anyway because you're essentially reduced back to the fixed point case. Yeah, okay. Um, so the having a double precision float gives you a much comfier range and the floating point aspect of the double precision float means that as a programmer, you don't have to concern yourself with scaling issues. You don't have to worry about clipping. You don't have to worry about where you set the the uh, decimal point in the in the actual calculation. You just do the calculation, and if the signal winds up being greater than one, you can actually pull it out of clipping without by just doing a simple gain. Okay, I understand. So, 
So from a from a computational perspective, double precision makes things much more um, double precision makes things much simpler, and it makes them, you know, essentially so that the computation essentially behaves like you are dealing with real numbers. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, like yeah. like you're doing a mathematical operation as opposed to a, com- a discrete computer math operation. Yeah. Now, right. why wouldn't why, why would you not use double precision? That's really the question, right? Why okay. would you not use double precision? So there's a few reasons that you wouldn't use double precision. One is that, you know, the reality is is that the, the, the numbers that you're going to st- send to and from converters are going to be 24-bit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And if you're going to convert them, if you're going to use them, with double precision, you got to convert them, and that's not a very expensive operation. But it's more expensive than no operation at all. So that's one reason. Mm-hmm. Another reason is that they take up twice as much space in memory. Yeah. So for algorithms that actually use a lot of memory, that that could be not trivial, right? I mean, like a big okay. reverb or something like that. Oh where yeah. You have tens or hundreds of megabytes of of impulse data. Yeah. The I difference so, between yeah. single precision and double precision for the impulse and the history data. Um, it is not trivial, and in yeah. particular, in that type of algorithm, it doesn't necessarily add anything. So yeah. you might not use it there. In things like straight summing, mm-hmm. you know, like mixing, mm-hmm. you generally don't need double precision. But sometimes, uh, the but the, if you if you're doing things where you're applying gains, you may find that having additional precision on the gain calculation and deferring the the need to dither until the end of the calculation is a benefit. Mm-hmm. In things mm-hmm. like EQs, that's where it starts to get very touchy. Okay. Because the problem is that you have these recursive structures that tend to have nearly canceling terms. And that's where you see the, the catastrophic loss of precision. And if you're not careful about managing your um, internal bit depth in the calculation, yeah. you'll find that you get these sort of bizarre sounds that come out of EQs, you know, either rumbles or farts or yeah. other sorts of non-good signal sounds. Yeah, and right. Yeah. So the, and, and so then the, the question is, well, if you have to worry about any of these things, why would you ever use floating point? And yeah. so the reason that you would use floating point is either you're concerned about the space that the the signal is taking up, right? Okay. You're either constrained mm-hmm. on memory or constrained on disk. Like for mm-hmm. example, if you have a, if you have a gigabyte recording mm-hmm. on mm-hmm. your disk, and you decide, well, I'll just record that with double precision float instead of 24-bit fixed, mm-hmm. then you know you're talking about almost three times the space. Mm-hmm. So now mm-hmm. instead of a gigabyte, you're talking about three gigabytes. Mm-hmm. That starts to add up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, uh, and, and if you're getting no benefit from it, then there's no point in doing it. Doing it. Yeah, so that's, that's one reason that we don't use double precision float for everything. Yeah. The other reason is that even even with the hardware that's in computers, mm-hmm. for for uh, basic scalar operations, which is basically you're doing one math operation at a time, mm-hmm. double precision and float and single precision floating point basically execute in the same amount of time. There's really no overhead for doing double precision relative to single precision. Mm-hmm. So there's not a lot of good reason to, to use floating point for single for basic single calculations inside of signal processing on a computer. Mm-hmm. But on DSPs or on um, if you're using some dedicated hardware in the PC, like for example the Altavec unit or the SSC unit, mm-hmm. those generally don't support doing um, multi-channel operations mm-hmm. with uh, double precision. They generally mm-hmm. support single precision. And you know the the SSC units and the Altavec units and some of the SIMD units and DSPs might get you a factor of four for certain types of operations in terms of how much computation you can do. So mm-hmm. they're kind of a big win if you can do it safely. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. So basically that's what gets you back to algorithm design and engineering. You know, well, if you didn't care about being able to actually get the most uh power out of any given piece of hardware, you would just do the naive thing and you know, you'd be able to run three plugins and they would sound great and that would be good. But mm-hmm. 
if you actually want to do larger scale projects, then you need to actually be able to uh, manage your hardware efficiently. And what the folks who are doing algorithm design and algorithm implementation are hopefully doing is analyzing their algorithms, analyzing the uh, nature of how these representations of, of uh, numbers and math work in the system and are making intelligent engineering decisions to optimize, to both optimize the runtime of the algorithm and also the precision of the calculation. So if you don't need the precision, then you're just wasting CPU. Yeah, that you can use for different things. If yeah. there was something that, you know, if you, if you could use the lower precision thing and then accelerate it by a factor of four, you should do that. Yeah. yeah. But if you can't, accelerated by a factor of four without damaging the precision of the calculation mm. to the point where it has an audible impact on what you're doing, then you shouldn't do that. And it's a, you know, it requires careful analysis and time. And then when you're all said and done, it also requires listening to it and making sure that even yeah. though in theory it should work, yeah. in practice it might not. Yeah, yeah that's something. And, yeah. Yeah. and unfortunately, of course, some of these, these defects are subtle. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's not like, oh, well, I, I used floats and, you know, uh, it just doesn't work right. It's, mm -hmm. I used floats and if I'm, if I carefully analyze it and listen to it, I find out that I have some shaped noise floor mm -hmm. that's like 20 dB higher than it needs to be. And it adds some sort of veil to the sound mm -hmm. and makes it sound, you know, muffled, yeah, slightly muffled. Mm -hmm. So, the, you know, it's not the sort of thing where you can just say, well, I'm going to punt and not listen to it. You have to be careful about this stuff. And, and, and that's the key to all of these sorts of processes is analyze, implement, and then profile. And, and profile in our world means listen in a good room with people with good ears yeah. and make sure that you're not missing things. Yeah. And especially this listening thing is also a question of the kind of experience that you got. And yes. so, well, I re also realized suddenly when you understand something, you suddenly l learn to he hear something. This is very interesting. It's very related to each other. Wow. So this is a one of, the, hmm? yeah. one of the sad things about that experience thing, right? Yeah. Is that you can be perfectly happy with something. Yeah. Think that everything's great. And then you, you hear something that reveals things that you had never noticed before. Yeah. And you rarely can go back. <laughs> <laughs> That's hard. Oh my god. Right. Yeah, yeah. You've done a lot of work with that. Oh my god. This gives a complete new perspective of those, of this coding aspect. Because um, I heard when I talk about some customers, I've said that can't be that complicated to implement this and this feature or this thing or this idea. When I hear about that, it's a completely different thing. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And wow. Awesome. This is a lot of stuff, man. I think. Yeah, let us do the next thing, because this leads perfectly into the next um, issue. Because this is about levels. Because okay. what I realized, I did this testing where I did some tracks and take care about that nothing has goes over minus ten dB. And. Um, Normally, take a look, take care that nothing goes to minus six or something. But I find out if you're doing something about minus 12, minus 10 in this range, because the new, or let me, say, let me say, the new red is minus 10. Um, yes. It sounds better. Yes. It was definitely something that really, um, where you get really confused in the beginning, because I, I realized so many, sometimes when someone showed me a production or when I got a production here in my studio, um, Sometimes they carefully leveling everything to nearly minus zero, and um, and I said, "Wow, what happened there?" So, mm. actually, if you look at the Mio manual, yeah. In fact, if you look at the Mio manual <laughs> that we wrote in like two thousand one, you'll find that it recommends that when you're doing a sound check, that you set your peaks at minus twelve. Okay. We've been saying that for about a decade. Wow. And so the reason for us is that I, and I believe this to be true for pretty much every commercial product that's available on the market today. Okay. But I know that it's true of our products. 
uh-huh. is that the converter chips that we use have uh, a, a distortion curve that looks kind of like this. You know, basically, if you look at any if you look at any converter chip, the distortion when the level of the inputting input signal is extremely low is relatively high. Yeah, yeah. Because basically, the thing is that you know the input signal is just right above the bit level, so you know you, you just can't manage the distortion down to the optimal level when the input signal is extremely low. Okay. And what happens is it drops real fast, and then it hits right around here, right around minus. 12 minus 6 or so it hits sort of the minimum okay and then as mm-hmm. you go past there it comes back up wow okay okay so then you got that kind of distortion curve ah interesting and okay so the idea is that basically what we've always recommended is that you target your peaks to be at the minimum of the distortion curve yeah yeah now, what what are you doing when you do that? I mean, if you choose, if you set your levels to be around minus ten, minus twelve, when you're sound checking, mm-hmm. then the the minus twelve corresponds to two bits, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you have a twenty you have a twenty four bit converter, and what you're doing is essentially what I was talking about when you're doing fixed point computations. You have to choose where you're going to set the zero point yeah. so that you have headroom, yeah. right? right? Yeah. So you're essentially doing the same thing. You know, the converters are fixed point. You're mm-hmm. saying, okay, I'm sort of setting my nominal full scale at minus 12. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, what you've done by that is that means that the noise floor of the converter relative to the maximum nominal level of your signal is 12 dB higher. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right. I mean, you're mm-hmm. essentially you're trading off. You have the full scale point, mm-hmm. and you have the noise floor point here. Yeah. And what you're doing is you're saying I'm going to move the full scale point here. Yeah. So you know the dynamic range of the sort of nominal area goes down, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and as a result, what you're going to suffer effectively is slightly higher noise. <laughs> yeah. Um, relative to the nominal full scale of the signal. However, the thing is that the converters and the preamps in the boxes are so quiet yeah. that that extra 12 dB still leaves you in the completely inaudible range. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So you're not going to perceive the, that loss. Even if, even if you go and you take that after you're all said and done, let's say that your signal never peaked above minus 12. Mm-hmm. And you decide that in order to press your CD or make your YouTube or iTunes tune, that in order for it to be level competitive, you need to shift it up back up those two bits. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So now you've effectively moved the dynamic range. The dynamic range hasn't changed. You've effectively moved the noise floor up 12 dB. Mm-hmm. But the thing is that the noise floor is so low that at 12 dB, you're still way better than like the uh, noise floor of a CD, mm-hmm. which is you know, beyond the the range of human hearing. Absolutely. So the thing is that you yeah. haven't really lost anything by making that shift, but mm-hmm. what you've gained is a lot. Because yeah. the thing is that now you're when you're hitting your peak levels, you're in the sweet spot of the distortion yeah. characteristics of the converter and the and the overall converter system. And the by being in the sweet spot of the converter system, you're getting essentially the cleanest input path that, that you can possibly get. Plus, you have an additional 12 dB of headroom protection. Yeah, that's what you need. Because mm. the thing is that everyone always goes over. Yeah, definitely, definitely, it, yeah. You know, you can, tell, you can tell a band to play as loud as they possibly can during sound check. Yeah, on the show they are louder. <laughs> when, when the audience comes in the room, or yeah. even just when they start playing and grooving with each other, and they mm. get in the pocket, and they feel... They're feeling it as opposed to just mm. practicing it. Yeah, they'll get louder. Absolutely. I, I've never seen a band that doesn't do that. No. <laughs> so, if you're sound checking at you know minus twelve or minus fifteen or something like that, you're building in, in some room for real dynamics in the music. Mm-hmm. Plus, you're also optimizing the converters. And the thing is that what you're throwing away is not. You're not throwing away anything that's really valuable. I mean, if you were down at like minus thirty or something like that, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
then you're starting to get to the point where you know now you've taken the 24-bit converter and you've changed it to an 18-bit converter of which the bottom four bits are noise so now you're like a 14-bit converter now you're starting to get to the point where you know you're you're back up on that curve that distortion curve yeah yeah right and when, if you bring the entire level back up yeah. you're brought your noise floor back up to the point where it actually starts to become audible yeah so the the trick to all of this is to try to set things in such a way that you're kind of walking the middle ground mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. at least with our converters that middle ground means peaking at around minus 12 if you want the absolute best results hmm. when you think about that aspect and i must imagine that most of the stuff are tracked or mastered in nearly the worst dynamic range that you can get from a converter yeah absolutely and, and then actually on the on the output side there's kind of a trick a kind of an interesting trick that you can do with the leo and the ulm8 yeah which is that you know this the those same aspects of the the it turns out that the input converters are less sensitive mm-hmm mm -hmm. If I remember correctly, so you know the distortion goes up less on the input side, okay, and mm -hmm. on the output side it goes up a little bit more. Wow. Okay. So, um, and in particular, the thing you've heard about this stuff that, for example, TC has been talking about and the EBU has been talking about with um, intersample peaks. Yeah, yeah. You know, so especially if you have like mastered material that's clipped. Yeah. Oh yeah. Where yeah, you right. actually have an illegal an actual illegal di digital stream when the illegal mm -hmm. digital stream is sent through a reconstruction filter on a converter yeah. it will um, it will actually generate peaks that are above full scale yeah so it's yeah mm. so the thing about that is that you know that is how that is re responded to by the converter and the analog in the converter is highly dependent on the implementation of the converter and the analog Uh, okay. Depending on yeah. what op amps or other amplifiers are used yeah. and what converter chips are used, a lot of those devices are run with very low rails, and they have the, okay. the penchant of locking up. Uh, so okay. you might get an intersample peak that's like this, right? I'm yeah. Back a little bit. So it goes like this, mm -hmm. and you know, here's full scale. It goes up above full scale and drops back down. But because it went above full scale, an op amp locks up. And you know it holds it clipped for like a long period of time before it drops back down. Yeah, right so the, 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 the impact of the yeah. intersample peaks can actually be substantially bigger than you would think. All right. Okay. Now, in our tests with the with the Leos and the Ulan eights, and and I believe the two eighty twos and the Ulan twos, although it's been a long time since I've looked at that aspect of those products, mm. we're pretty good. You know, we clip and then we unclip, and we don't hang out for a long time. But there are lots of other things that, that will actually react much more badly. And in particular, the sorts of things that will tend to react much more badly are things like, you know, I consumer audio playback gear. Okay. So mm. the thing is that mm. it might yeah. be worse for someone who's listening to it after they get it, download it from iTunes, than it is for you. <laughs> so when you're actually constructing your masters, You really kind of want to avoid that because there's some possibilities of um, of long term problems in the playback that mm -hmm. you may not actually be hearing because you're using professional gear that handles it better. Yeah. Okay. But the thing that we found that's quite interesting is because we have the analog domain gain control on the mm -hmm. outputs of the Mios, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you can actually do a ratio metric gain, right? You can take the out the digital output level down, say six or twelve dB. And you can raise the analog gain up six or twelve dB. Yeah, right. Okay. And the output from the converters is the same. I mean, so, the output at the outside output of the box is the same. You know, you haven't actually changed the volume, but what you have done is you've altered the digital digital stream that's going into the converter. So if you hit one of those intersample peaks, there's actually headroom inside the converter to handle it. Okay. And you actually reconstruct the analog signal properly. Wow. And then on our output stage, there's plenty of headroom. And you know you'll just actually get the reconstructed insert sample peak instead of a sort of a bizarre clip. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And 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 that also optimizes you back into the lowest distortion point of the um, DAC as well. So you'll find that things will be clearer 
and, and more representative of what the actual digital signal is. So it's kind of a nice trick that you can do with, with our boxes. Yeah, I have to do that, definitely. And I, I would recommend this to all users, and maybe they can give some feedback what they find out, because this is very interesting. Just lowering the digital side, something like 6, 10 dB, and put it up on the analog side. Uh, uh, yeah, perfect. Yeah. This is interesting. This, this leads me to one thing. Um, what people are asking me, they're asking me why is the, the U, they, there are so many people are amazed about those ULN8 preamps that they're asking me, why don't you release those preamps as a single product? But maybe there's, there's a complete other aspect because you have um, access to both sides of the preamps, of the input and of the output side, what means the connection to your digital part or the conversion part. When I imagine what happens when I plug in a preamp um, where I have all those input and output stages of a lot of op -amps, maybe some EQ and compression going on, some saturation stuff and things like that. And from there you go into your converter. There are some complete different worlds that you really have to match together. Or on the other hand, if you have a chance to match them together, you have a complete different perspective. Or, a bit, or we said, yeah, you have a complete different playground where you can work on. Well, it's definitely the case that, you know, when we design this stuff, we optimize the stages for the stuff that follows. Yeah, yeah. When, when, you, when you're dealing with a standalone converter to a standalone preamp or a standalone preamp into a standalone converter, yeah. they both have to go from what their natural levels would be to, you know, sort of the standard, the industry standard plus 18 dBU or plus mm -hmm. 20 dBU levels. Mm -hmm. And the reality is is that neither the preamp nor the converter really needs to operate that hot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in fact, they don't, right? So basically yeah. what you wind up in your gain staging is you take your very low-level mic signal, you drive it way up to mm -hmm. plus Absolutely. 24 yeah. dBU, yeah. then you run it into the converter, which drops it down to like minus 10 dBU yeah. before it goes into the converter chip. Yeah, yeah. So the thing is that each one of those gain stages has the opportunity to add more noise to the system. Right? So if you go from that. mic level directly to plus 10 for the converter, yeah. you don't have the additional potential analog gain injection noise yeah. because the pad will remove some of the noise that you generate on the gain, but not all of it. Yeah, and then I, I'm thinking about all those gain stagings, what it adds as, uh, also on distortion. Yep. That's another thing. So what? that that's definitely one of the reasons that we build these integrated products. It's not because, you know, well, if we just took this product out, we could make a better mic preamp mm -hmm. as a standalone box and we could make mm -hmm. a better converter as a standalone box. We actually get real benefit from us integrating a world-class preamp with mm -hmm. a world-class converter. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, I know that there's some sense in the industry, well, you know, a box that's dedicated to something has to be better than a box that's doing more than one thing. Yeah. But if you design the preamp as if it's a dedicated preamp, yeah. and you design the converter as if it's a dedicated converter, but then you optimize the connection between those two, <laughs> I would argue that that gives you a better result than two independent products. Definitely. And definitely. It's certainly a less expensive result. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because the thing is that if we build if we build our preamps into a external box, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're digitally controlled preamps, mm -hmm. which means that we need a power supply. Mm -hmm. We need a preamp. We need the preamps. We need the full digital control system, and we need a case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if you look at how much we charge for the preamps, just to like upgrade a Leo to a ULN8. They're very inexpensive per channel. They're like, what, $100 per channel or something like yeah, that? $125 something like that, yeah. per channel? Yeah, yeah. Um, you can't get preamps like that for $125 a channel from anyone else. Definitely not. But part of the reason is that everyone else has to charge you for a case and for connectors yeah. and for power supplies and for front panels and control systems and yeah. a box and all that stuff. And even though that doesn't really add much value to the process of recording, it's a necessary thing to actually build the product. Definitely. And in, in the case of the ULN8, we're able to optimize the connection. We get rid of the fact that you need interconnects. I mean, 
cables are not inexpensive. At least good quality cables are not inexpensive, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you could spend for eight channels, you could spend a couple hundred dollars on cables to go from a preamp to a converter. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. that's a couple hundred dollars that you just don't have to spend. Yeah, yeah, true. That's another aspect. I didn't think about that. Yeah, what co the cost of a connector? If you think about it, if you want to have a good connector, get a good mechanical connection, how much you got to pay for that? And interesting, yeah, very, very interesting aspect. Wow. So you know, our approach, our our design philosophy on that product was that we could actually provide something that was better than a bunch of standalone boxes mm -hmm. connected into a system yeah. and provide better system integration as well as better performance for lower cost. <laughs> very, very good aspect. Never thought about that. Oh, right. Okay. Well, so as a conclusion, track lower, <laughs> make better recordings <laughs> with that. And um, and track as clean as possible, finally. Well, the thing is that basically, you know, you're not going to get benefit from clipping digitally, right? Definitely. I mean, <laughs> clipping analog is a different question. Yeah, yeah. Right? You know, the, you, there are character aspects of various analog devices that are engaged when you hit them hard. Yeah. That's just not the case of a converter. Mm -hmm. When you drive a converter past full scale, you're generating what's called an illegal s signal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, it is not it is no longer properly sampled mm -hmm. you've generated aliasing products and you know it just essentially cannot be right so yeah. Yeah. you want to avoid it if you possibly can yeah. it turns out that at least for I think the vast majority of products that are available on the market that aiming for around minus 10 or minus 12 not only gives you the benefit of really protecting you from clipping mm -hmm, but it also mm -hmm. gives you the benefit of really uh, optimizing the performance of the converter while essentially giving up not much of anything. Yeah. And the, um, the reality of the situation is that you can always turn it up digitally and digital gain is a noiseless process. Okay, yeah, true. You yeah. raise the noise floor, you raise the noise floor, you know, uh, that's already recorded, but there's no additional noise added by adding digital gain. and you give yourself the flexibility of adding unless you're like recording through a transformer or something like that where you mm -hmm. actually are getting that sort of analog soft distortion characteristic that doesn't exceed the digital signal range mm -hmm. so that the anti-aliasing filters and the converters can properly filter out the uh, ultrasonic distortion products mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you're doing that, then you know maybe there's some benefit to actually hitting things hard, but making sure you don't hit your converter hard. Even if you do that, you still don't want to hit your converter hard. <laughs> and if you re if you're recording clean, mm -hmm. the idea is that the cleaner you are, the better results you'll be able to get out of additional flavor that you add later with something like character or mm -hmm. some of our some of the other uh, signal processing products that other people make. Yeah. Because the yeah. thing is that what you want to do is you want to apply a certain type of clean distortion to the signal. Mm -hmm. You don't want to apply distortion to a clip and distorted signal because then you get intermodulation between the two effects and one of the effects wasn't good in the first place. Yeah, right, right. Right? Yeah, so yeah. aiming for the cleanest recording chain gives you flexibility later. Yeah, later. Or you you have the opportunity to give those those very special sound to the very important signal for a voice or whatever it is, the lead instrument in the situation. And if you have added colored everything, then you have another problem. Yeah, that's right. Oh man, there's a lot of stuff. <laughs> and I made a lot of notes here. And um, there was really digital and level explained, I must say. Awesome. Great, BJ. Oh. I hope it's helpful, and uh, yeah. we'll talk again maybe yeah. in, in a week or so. In a week, some, or you, you are on the uh, developer conference? Yeah, I'm going to be going to WWDC next yeah. week, so it'll be the week after. The week after, yeah. Yeah, in the meantime, if someone has a question, don't hesitate. Yeah. Drop an email and let Absolutely. us know. And maybe also if someone has other questions that they'd like to see us discussing. Yeah, we're welcome. Huh? <laughs> Absolutely. Great. Okay. Thanks Great. a lot, BJ.
Thank and you. Uh, it's great talking. <laughs> great. <laughs> okay.